So at this point, our listeners already know that uh, this is never going to be an experience that sounds that good to listen to. No, I mean, we're not even pulling the uh, the shitty sound baffle blankets out that we use for accuracy third for this podcast because we're so much more punk rock than that project. Yes, we are. So <laughs> now that Beth and Rax aren't in the room, we are way more punk rock. Yeah. Oh, God, am I relaxed and less stoned. <laughs> this is great. I can actually be cogent during this and follow like what you're saying. It's yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, nice. So who are you? Uh, my name is Zeno Evil, uh, X-E-N-O, not Z. It's the prefix, not the philosopher. Um, I've had that moniker since about 1993, which is before any of you had your shitty names. Uh, sorry, wait, no, beautiful listener. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come across <laughs> hostile right out the bat, but uh, we're gonna be dancing on that I line am. pretty hard. <laughs> uh, what, so that's my name. I could go into some background, but who the fuck are you? I'm D Day. Um, I've had that nickname since. The mid to late 90s when I wanted to start a graphic design and web design company, which I called D-Day Design because I couldn't figure out like any other of my high school nicknames to use. Mm -hmm. Um, Like Chico Design, that sounded racist to me even back then. Well, and also Chico is just a garbage city. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't even know know that that. You're on the East Coast. No, yeah, it was uh, named... It was a nickname that I got from my brother's nickname, which is based on our surname, which is like the least interesting way to get a nickname. Man, you are giving away a lot of details about your real name. Uh, That's cool. I'm not going to try to do that, but if people have some good Google skills, they'll be able to find it. I'm not running for office until uh, the populace is like super cool with Mm -hmm. finding pictures of me with green hair wearing skirts. Yeah. Yeah, mine is like. I have run for office, and that's one of the few things that comes up if you Google my real name. But in Seattle, right? Or no, Austin? Texas. Ah, Austin. See, okay, so now if, if people understand where I've lived and when, they can piece together, man, I'm going to get so many stalkers. Nah, it's fucking fine. Like, there's nobody who gives a shit about us on 8chan yet. By the time 8chan finds out about us, like, they're going to have to be yeah. pretty fat and pimply and stinky to find, like, our pilot episode and figure out who we are. That's true. Okay, so... Why should anyone listen to us? There's a few weird details about me, and I'm sure there are plenty of weird details about you. Uh, I sold morphine when I was 16. Huh. Uh, I was a web developer in 1999 before the dot-com bubble burst and then lost that. I was involved in a weird speakeasy that ended up with a large cosmopolitan city spending about $6 million on Vice and failing to convict anyone on any of the charges <laughs> that they tried to bring. Uh, I've been working for Burning Man for uh, about 20 years, which is about half my life. Uh, oh, that's a quick little yeah. scattershot. Little teasers, I guess. We can talk about those later. Mm-hmm. Um, I, f- God, I feel like such a weird person, and that's such a, a stupid thing to say for like an outwardly presenting... Um, middle class white guy, but like growing up as like the only Jew in a backwoods Pennsylvania town and then moving to San Francisco and being involved in like radically queer theater and uh, Burning Man for a quarter of my life and the weird like cacophonous parties and uh, outings that we would go on. Um, I think I have an interesting perspective as to how we can all be doing considerably better. Yeah, I agree. I was going to ask you how your production company is going. I don't know if you want to name it, but or if, um, it's not I, really I know you going. Have a whole lot of other duties right now, and that would probably fall by the wayside. And you know. I mean, I I am always <laughs> ready to promote naked dudes reading Lovecraft. I used to have a theatrical mm-hmm. company, and uh, my theater partner moved to Portland, and there went almost all of our projects, but we still do Naked Dudes reading Lovecraft every once in a while. io9 did a blurb on us um, the first year we did it. Mm. Um, We we came up with it as a joke. Um, My buddy Andy made the joke that at this pre-existing show, naked chicks read sci-fi or naked girls reading sci-fi. I don't know. Either one's sexist if I say it, so Mm. I'll cover Mm. my sexist bases. Um... He made the joke that, like, we should do naked dudes reading Lovecraft in the male bathroom Mm -hmm. during their show 
and anyone who comes in can have like us naked, like shouting about Cthulhu in the bathroom. And well, tentacles and dicks. You mm-hmm. know. Oh, yeah. there it's is horror. It's all horror because those is, things are all gross. Uh, body horror is cosmic horror. Yes. Um, yeah, our friend uh, Ty, who runs a theater in San Francisco, jumped on that thread and was just like, oh, my God, if you guys do this, I will help you produce it. Mm-hmm. And that's a no-brainer because mm-hmm. if someone who owns a theater tells you you don't have to pay for theater space, do a goddamn show. Yeah, especially in San Francisco. The rent there is insane. Um, I would like to let everybody know that uh, that this podcast is brought to you by Jars. Jars. Oh, yeah? What What about Jars? Well. How are they? You, They're great. You buy your food in a jar. You wash your jar. You now have a glass. Whoa. Put something to drink in that glass. Jars. Oh, I usually just smash them. Usually with like half the food still in them. I am. Have I been doing it wrong? I have always been so baffled by and against people just breaking glass. Like it, it's not quite a pet peeve. It's just a thing that like I don't understand as a hick. Why it's fun to like. What? Make things really sharp and in the ground in a way that, like, I think we should be blowing more stuff up. Wow. Okay. So I lived in a place in Seattle in a basement. We had cement floors and cement walls, but we had to lug our recycling up two flights of stairs to get it to the bin. Mm-hmm. And no one wanted to do it. So we had a 50 gallon uh, recycling bin, and all the glasses were in there. And instead of just lugging that up, what we would do is compact the glass by moving all of our furniture to the side and taking turns throwing all of them against the wall. And then at, at one point, a couple of years after we had just been doing this on the regular, I looked at the wall and noticed it just shimmered from all of the embedded broken glass. <laughs> so, Sounds like you breathed in some of that glass, buddy. Yeah, well, my voice is a little rough. I have trouble breathing. That's fine. I uh, in life my... is going to take us all. It's, it's you know, death takes a lifetime. It's fine. So um, the reason why I have a ruler as a tattoo on my arm um, is because I used to make lamps like a lot. I would find lamps on uh, the street. I would repair them. I would try to make a lampshade for it out of like mm. found art pieces. Um, and this once, I found like this really nice green glass bowl that was broken on the sidewalk. So I took it and like I broke it into slightly smaller pieces and I put it in a blender (laughs) and I blended that glass up. And my plan was to mix that with clear acrylic medium and smear that on something uh, that was clear um, plastic or clear glass and use that to diffuse the light. Um, And after I blended the glass, I took the top off the blender and this just like gaseous. Yeah, this like gaseous glass dust came out and like. I, like, backpedaled away from it like I had opened up a radioactive refrigerator or something. Mm -hmm. Um, Not that that's a thing, but you can imagine the backpedaling. Very cartoon-like. That's fair. Well, I think this podcast is going fabulously. (laughs) Yes. Let's dial up that excitement, guys. Let's go. Hey, 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 listen to us. (laughs) Now now we're in the morning zoo portion of the podcast. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, what we're thinking about, dear listener... At, and also, we didn't really touch on this. Are we talking to each other and the listener is just eavesdropping? Or are we talking directly to the listener, uh, side eye to each other? Um, I, I think a bit of both. Um, yeah. I think definitely for introductory purposes and asides, we're talking to the listener. Mm-hmm. But like, I'm here to gain a rapport with you, Zena. Right, because we're not friends otherwise. We don't, <laughs> if, if we don't have microphones in front of us, we don't talk. It, it, so. That's fair. Yeah, <laughs> I mean we we so we're just we're we text making other more than I text with to like our friendship making. Got it. Yeah, it, everybody gets to find out like what happens when when D Day finally takes an interest in what is actually happening with Xena. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everyone gets to learn what D Day is because all the people that I've talked to that have listened to Accuracy Third, like, oh, I heard your episode in Accuracy Third. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this uh, podcast with D-Day. And they're like, who's that? And I'm like, wait, you, but you listened to Accuracy Third, right? And yeah, but like, who yeah. knows Who knows if that's one of the episodes that Beth let us like name ourselves <laughs> at the beginning of. She's that's true. really anti-format. Sure. Um, she but, slipped like a quarter of the episodes past but us. Literally, I've had uh, another friend be like, oh, yeah, no, I totally listened to you. Uh, who's that guy? And I'm like, it's D-Day. He's cool. I knew him before I ever did the whole Burning Man thing. 
well, the DPW thing. And uh, they're like, oh, okay. And I was like, hey, so dear listener, if you're listening to this to get to know Zeno a little better, please pay attention to the other voice. It's D Day. Yeah. He's pretty cool. I like uh, him. I'm all I like right talking to him. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have a pre-existing cult like uh, Zeno does. I am. Uh, ah, you got accuracy third. You got all those people. Come on. I do. Don't cut yourself um, short. But like that's that that's D Day. Um, I'm I'm a different D Day. Like I'm huh. bouncing myself. Off. Okay, so. So we're trying to do a thing with this podcast where we're actually getting to know each other and like I'm talking to you about okay. things that you're interested in and about you and vice versa. Mm-hmm. When we're doing Burning Man stuff, I find it very difficult not to slip into the self-aggrandizing, um, oh, yeah. like yeah. much more blustery persona mm-hmm. that I developed at Burning Man to uh, cover well, a bit yeah, of lack of confidence. It's very performative. Mm-hmm. And and it's not morning zoo, but it's definitely like that's doing radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is us doing the sort of podcast which is much less produced, much mm-hmm. farther from NPR. Yeah, and like oh, so much, <laughs> so much it is, easier. It is practically NPR. Actually, third, it's like w- maybe a hair's breadth below NPR. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, Terry Gross is pretty much the same as Beth. Uh, I don't think she's as open to uh, some of the. You know what? I'm I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry. I love just had you, to go off on a, a limb on that one. <laughs> okay. Well, so the topic that I chose today is uh, is podcasts and why are there so many of them? Um, why are they good? Why are they bad? Uh, what's going on? And as far as format goes, we're gonna try to stick with this format. We'll see if it lands. We'll see if we it'll uh, evolve. Rejigger it. Yeah. But uh, probably like a fluffy uh, kind of bullshit topic. And then maybe a more serious topic that uh, me and D-Day bring to the table and sometimes maybe don't let each other know what the topic is so we can have um, a more free-flowing sort of conversation about it. Um, But I would like to get into... The massacres I'm going to teach you about. Oh, God. (laughs) It's the rape of Nanking all over again. Yeah. I I I didn't mention that for a reason. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, I'm into massacres. I, I want to talk about that shit. I want to talk about serious stuff, but I also oh, want to talk about fuck. What the fuck is wrong with people? My God, so much is wrong with people. Like, I hate people so much, but I don't hate people that much. I have an overall optimistic view of people, which does not come across. <laughs> people, people do not get that after uh, even years of knowing me. They don't know how positive and, uh, and optimistic that I am. I'm just so outwardly disappointed because right. my well, optimism mm-hmm. keeps being crushed. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. oh, people have such profound possibilities. Oh, and they missed it. They only got 80% great. And we're telling people right at the top of the podcast that we're coming at this from very different perspectives, so that's going to be interesting. <laughs> oh, no, conflict. Yes. I'm going to take you down with my opinions. Oh, okay. Well, we're doing that now. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we throw beer cans on the floor. At this podcast. And then when the podcast is done, we pick them up and we clean up the floor. (laughs) Yeah. So format-wise, I want to let the listeners know that at the end of every episode, um, one or both of us are going to have some homework assignments Mm -hmm. that I'd like listeners to uh, do and then perhaps turn in their homework via either email or uh, Patreon or Facebook (laughs) or the Twitter. Um, I will... God, no, I won't manage the Facebook. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, we'll no, find, no, no, no. We'll no find a listener you know to manage can, the can Facebook. I just, can I just actually just put the kibosh on Facebook? How about no Facebook presence whatsoever? Uh, I, I don't mean, think we need it. For ethical reasons, I would agree. But for listener reasons, like... Who cares about listeners? That's not you, listener. Not you personally. The other listeners. Yeah. Fuck them. Well, nobody cares about the other <laughs> listeners. But like, as long as people are on there having to deal with like their folks and their shitty high school friends, um, you might as well sometimes find out that like there's a video of Zeno slapping me that's been put on YouTube. You will never see my face in that, but there will be a ruler on the arm slapping him in the face. Um, I've got uh, that Guy Fox mask that uh, I crossed with uh, a gas mask that you can wear. Uh, okay, maybe. Um, I have started a Twitter. This is my first uh, social media account, and I'm announcing it 
on the podcast, and I will not reply to anything on there, and I will not post anything. It is uh, at dash Zeno with an X uh, at Twitter. So I'm also on Twitter. I am uh, at a three R D underscore D A Y. Um, that's also my Twitter handle for accuracy third and for myself because I'm not going to switch between accounts when no, I'm screaming no. at the president. Oh my God, we have this technology where I can swear at the goddamn idiot president on a daily fucking basis. Yeah, isn't it great? And I terrible? don't know. <laughs> I am very adamant with the amount that I don't know what the fuck is going on or if I'm affecting things in the slightest. Well, you're affecting some people. You're affecting the people that read it. But you also don't get to decide who reads it, which is amazing. Because I, I think if you and I were in a room and we decided to tell some off-color jokes, I think the world would be fine. Mm-hmm. And if we used some terms that we as straight white men were not supposed to use, as long as we did it outside of the the observation of people that might be hurt by it, I think it would be okay. Because you and I know that we're not trying to hurt anyone. And sometimes transgressing social norms is kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you do it in a public thing like this, where just any person on the internet can hear it, then they can actually be hurt by it. Mm-hmm. And then you have to actually take responsibility for that hurt that you caused. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about podcasts and the internet in general is a lot of people really think that they're just sitting around in a room with their friends, and they're not. They're broadcasting these weird moments that, in the context of their friends, is probably totally fine. Mm -hmm. But context is super important for communication. And so when you just decide to put all of your life on the internet, you're going to hurt people. People are going to respond and be like, hey, you shouldn't say that. And then you might get defensive, and then all of a sudden there's this animosity and and, and war, which and I am offensive. Um, yeah, me too. I I think things are funny that like objectively most people don't think are funny. It's my practice to to try to keep the jokes that I make from making fun of people who don't have as much institutional power as I do. Um, and it's hard because those are the really easy jokes to make. That's Those are the jokes that I grew up listening to. Granted, those jokes were most, mostly Polish jokes and not jokes about people that look different than the people who are predominantly in power. But it's the same sort of, well, you come from this people, so you're less than. And luckily, I think some of it, Something that has helped me in in my life is not having been indoctrinated with religion when I was a child and not starting off with an us-then mentality of, you know, we are the inside group, the outside group gets punished forever. Yeah, and and so my background is sort of like that, except my in-group was just me. (laughs) And... For multiple reasons, I really only saw it as me against the world. And so making fun of one person didn't really mean much more than making fun of another person. Yep. But, uh, you know, I'm learning a lot more empathy and compassion and, and, and whatnot, and that shit's really important. But I also think that, you know, the things that Stephen Colbert did in his uh, first show, mm-hmm. The Colbert Report, he was like – he was – Saying things because it's funny that someone might actually think that. I had a I had a roommate and his father, who argued with me about the fact that Stephen Colbert was actually a conservative Republican. Everybody thinks he's doing an act, but he's Catholic. He actually believes more of this than he doesn't. And I was like, "How can you not see that this is naked satire?" Right, right. And so when we make jokes. Um, like that, where, you know, a lot of times I will say something absolutely reprehensible to make the point that it is reprehensible and how ridiculous it is for someone to say that. But now in this media environment, you have people that will see that, see that it gets like laughs 
and say, oh, that's comedy. I get it. I can now say that and I can mean it too. And that, and then, you know, these white supremacists are like, uh, hey, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. And it's really hard for us to be able to make terrible jokes anymore because now people that don't understand the context or the fact that we're making fun of them latch onto that and say that it's now okay in culture to make terrible statements. And some of it is comedy. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Some, some of them are jokes and they are well-constructed jokes that are at somebody's expense who should not be the butt of that joke. Some of it is just straight up racist shit and you got caught and you say it's a joke when what you really mean is I didn't intend anybody to hear me say that out loud. Right. Um, and I think it's also like in the way that nobody really thinks that they're the bad guy um, except like maybe Carl Rove. Um, not he really many... did sit in that role very comfortably. It yeah. was like he was easing into a hot tub. Mm -hmm. and he was like, this yeah, is Yeah, I mean, right. Steve Bannon knows that he's a bad guy, but yeah. most people, like, they're not looking at their narrative that way or objectively. And, like, I think some people are racists and should be called racists. Um, I think some people are white supremacists who understand that they are white supremacists. I think there are a lot of people who who do racist things and have white supremacist beliefs that we could maybe teach a different degree of empathy to. I agree. If we called their behavior racist and not them racists. Yeah. Well, and but that's... it's real fucking hard to want to parse that with somebody who's doing some racist shit. Oh, yeah. No, that's, I mean, that is straight up like Martin Luther King. If someone's punching you in the face, you have to have love in your heart, like, and not fight back. That's, it's very difficult thing mm -hmm. to do. When you're just like, and, and it, a lot of it's language, like when you are on Twitter or Facebook or I don't know what the kids are doing, this is the Snapchats. But if you're like on the internet and someone says something just, you know, terrible and you're like, that's racist, it's ambiguous about if you're calling that person fundamentally uh, and in another soul, like an evil racist or if you're saying what you just said was racist and you should be aware of that and i think it would behoove a lot of people to give some people the benefit of the doubt and understand that a lot of people are ignorant about how things work and if you can tell them what you just said sounds racist instead of you're a racist it opens up a dialogue uh that is a lot more likely to reach uh, that person's humanity and understanding. Yeah, like as progressive as my folks are, um, being like consummate hippies from uh, hippiedom in the 60s, like they were at the progressive edge of belief for generations. And they're not that progressive anymore. Yeah. Um, like I have to have conversations with my folks about like, the new comedy specials that come out and they're just like, Oh, well, these are hilarious for these reasons. I'm like the first 20 minutes of it was, was them calling like millennials and uh gen Y and Z kids like snowflakes because they don't want to be called epithets for homosexual or, or trans or be judged by their skin color and shit. Like, it's it's kind of amazing that with uh, the advanced information and uh, communication that we have, we've moved both leftward and rightward so severely as communication has sped up. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily a bubble-based thing. <clears throat> Definitely the uh, Fox News thing is a silo. I mean, when 65 and olders are your main audience um they have a siloed concept of how you get mass communication anyway so you can go on fox news and say that the president like hasn't even had the whiff of a scandal in the past two years and a bunch of those people will not know that they shouldn't believe that because that's the only news source they get um, but i think a lot of the shift has happened because we've been online in these communities 
and we've talked to people with diametrically opposed beliefs to ours, but we're communicating in shorthand, and there's yeah. very little nuance there. So let's bring this back around to the topic that I wanted to talk about, which is podcasts. <laughs> so Twitter, you like literally the point is you have to make it short and concise and attention grabbing, and I think podcasts give people the chance to think out a full thought, discuss it. And then also there's no algorithm that Facebook and Twitter has, which is like, um, well, our AI has decided that you will be incensed by this podcast. So we're going to make you listen to that. Mm -hmm. So podcasts represent the democratization of, you know, thought and discourse and also a self-selection that's valuable. Mm hmm. It could be a little siloing, could be a little bubbly, because, you know, I have my the podcasts I listen to, and they definitely represent uh, the thought structure that I came to it with. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one reason why I want to do this podcast, is because it gives me a chance to formulate my thoughts. Because I have all this stuff kind of jumbling around in my brain, like anyone does. And I think if you are put on the spot and have to actually put your thoughts into words out loud, it actually does hone uh, how you think and what you think. And, you know, I definitely gone down some logical argument paths where I'm like, oh, that's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never would have figured out how wrong I was had I not tried to explain it to someone else. Right. And so I think that's really valuable for public discourse. And I think... The more people that have podcasts, the better. Um, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but you started Accuracy Third after listening to Kevin Smith. About uh, that's Rex. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, I don't well, do anything you because it, right? of Accuracy or because of Kevin Smith. Um, yeah, we were sitting around uh, at Burning Man. Um, I believe the first year that I had Rex on my team and in a management position. Um, and we were sitting around during like the first few doldrums of the event, um, when we were switching over from work mode to party mode and Rex just floated the idea of, <clears throat> he's always wanted to do a podcast. He was thinking we could do a Burning Man, uh, storytelling podcast. Um, is that something that I would be interested in doing and Beth would be interested in editing and Beth had wanted to get into podcast editing that was a part of her five-year plan um oh, cool i didn't know that okay. and i don't have five-year plans um but i had just recently finished listening to the uh first season of startup um and uh that's by uh alex goldman that uh started gimlet media mm -hmm. um and it's just the story of him leaving npr and I think he worked on This American Life or Marketplace or both. Mm. Um, and he was talking about, like, it was definitely Marketplace because he was talking about economics and he was an economics reporter. And, like, when he would talk to people that had successful startups, they had, like, not only found their niche of what they were good at, but they figured out personally what they could leverage that other people in that field don't have. Mm. And what Rex and I had um, and Beth between us was like 25 years of knowing people at Burning Man and like 15 years of working for Burning Man. So we had all of this access that wasn't open to other people. And that's what made me say yes. Um, and not really knowing how being project partners with them would work out. And yeah, it's it worked out fine. It's worked out pretty good. Yeah. 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 yeah I don't want to leave. I'm not about to quit. <laughs> good. I, I think I still have uh, maybe one more episode in me on the actually third. Well, but, wait uh, until uh, you see the um, the damn girl episode. Yeah, um, I, I don't know what Beth's edit of it is going to be, but that was a sloppy night, Zena. I know it was a sloppy night, and I will stand by it. That's fine. I did that. <laughs> it's uh, it's garbage. Um, you showed up wrecked. Oh, very much so. Yes, and Daddy Issues was there. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. She can attest. Well, to... you guys had just met. You were all into getting drunk and sucking yeah. face. Yeah, and that's fine. Uh, well, I'm I'm down to present uh, whatever I do, warts and all. Mm -hmm. um, I I do understand that if that episode goes out, I am implicitly asking someone to spend some time listening to that, 
and I don't want to waste anyone's time. Uh huh. And that's pretty much what I did. I'm sure. I don't remember. Uh, I'm not proud of it, uh, but I won't walk away from it. I won't say I won't do it, or yeah. I didn't do it. So uh, that's fine. But I do. I would like to actually say like why I quit and the circumstances around uh, mm-hmm. around that, and then maybe do like a a quick little banjo, Dave and Slim said this, and here's where I want to. You know. But aside from that, I'm done with Burning Man. I don't really want Burning Man to be much uh, incorporated into this thing that we're sure. doing. I'm sure it will, because it's a huge part of each other's lives. But yeah, I don't want Burning Man to really factor in a whole lot on this, because both you and I have a bunch of other uh, outside of Burning Man stories. Mm-hmm. And kind of how I went to Burning Man was, hey, or what really blew my mind, honestly. Like, when I got there in, in 97... On Wallapai Playa, so I'm better than all of you, except for some, um, was the profound intensity of the awesome that people brought to that event and what they were doing back in their homes and what they had going on in their lives and the just weird shit that they had. So I really thought that the participants were bringing weird to Burning Man. Mm -hmm. And nowadays I feel like a lot of normal people are going to Burning Man and taking weird away as, as their, uh, their cultural kind of like a subway card. Like I've been to Burning Man six times. Give me a free subway sandwich. Like, Hey, look, uh, I got weird. Uh huh. Um, and yeah, I just saw the, the cultural flow kind of reverse. And, you know, if, if you know plumbing, reversing flow is usually, like, a bad thing. Well, it's not usually good for the plumbing. Right. I mean, the shit gets yeah, the to shit escape the plumbing. the shit comes back up in the toilet is what yeah, I'm saying. the shit is Sometimes thrilled. this is the shower. You mm-hmm. don't want that. No. No, you don't. You're going to talk about Burning Man on the other thing? Yeah. I mean, there's so goddamn much talking about Burning Man that I do, and... Mm. I mean, I was as much of a person who was a proselytizer for that experience as anyone, but, like, I really talk about Burning Man all the time now in a way that, like, I would very much try not to talk about it for a while after the event just because of how much talking about it there is when you're planning for it. And you, do you remember next, next uh, remember last year and when you're at the event, you're talking about all the different things you, you have done and will do. And then, man, like give it a rest for six to nine months. I think, I think it does rob a lot of people of a lot of energy that they could be putting into more interesting things. Mm-hmm. Or if not more, I, I don't know, differently interesting things. Um, and that's not, that's not bad. Uh, if people want to, you know, put all that energy into that and have that impact on that community, that's fine. But like once you get locked into this cycle of like, oh, that's how you express yourself and that's mm-hmm. how you uh, contribute art to the world or, you know, get your personality in front of people, I think it kind of robs people of their autonomy or, you know, the the notion that you can just kind of make up whatever you want in the outside world. Uh-huh. You can make events and put your passion into it. And change people's lives that way. Like, mm-hmm. uh, Burning Man, it doesn't have to be, like, a, a mediating structure, just like Facebook. Like, why would I tell a multinational corporation a personal n- story and have them deliver that to a friend of mine? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. I know that person. I can contact that person. I can just give it to them directly. Why does there need to be a third person involved? Yeah, just have a fucking blog. We, yeah, well, we I, figured it out on blogs on our own websites ago. 25 uh-huh. years ago. And uh, I mean, honestly, I think everyone should have a server in their own home that has inbound connections, but that's a different story. Yeah, I think we need to transform how the internet works, but uh, you know, first this paradigm will crumble. And well, I have then... I have a homework assignment. I want the listeners to just go out and try a thing. You don't have to do it. That's fine. But when you turn your homework in, we'll reward you by paying attention to you. Um, My homework is put together something through either uh, Patreon, Swag, or uh, direct donations with some sort of content on the internet that you like. That's not this podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, 
what I've done is I budgeted about $20 a month through recurring contributions to artists that I absolutely love. And I hate advertisement as a model on the internet. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of the things that made Facebook so powerful and dumb is that people expected their stuff to be free and it's not free at all. So um, there's a like a web comic called catandgirl.com that I contribute $3 a month to. She's been doing this for 20 years. Wow. And she's never had an advertisement. She has swag. She's absolutely f- insightful. Just one of the most amazing web comics I've ever seen. Um, also, Small Beans. There's a bunch of ex-cracked uh, contributors. Um, once Facebook destroyed Cracked. And it was all a lie. It was all a lie. We can <laughs> do it. Okay, but really quickly, Small Beans. Uh, one of the contributors from Cracked went off and tried to make his own thing, and that's what he's doing. He releases podcasts and uh, video and actually written stuff and refuses to do ads. They only do Patreon. And part of that is the resentment from what happened to Cracks.com. And Cracks.com was gorgeous as a humor site. It was really good. They were doing a lot of good, smart stuff, and they got completely screwed. So I contribute to them. So as a homework assignment, I'd like to uh, challenge people to say, if nothing else, maybe $20 as a one-time thing. You can donate $20 just once doesn't have to be recurring to some things that you find valuable on the internet, especially directly to the contributors or Mm -hmm. bands or anything like that. I have all my ad blockers on. So when I do see the things I like on YouTube, they are not getting monetized. And so that feels like I'm kind of stealing from them. So I'd like to give them money directly without the intermediary of YouTube or Google or Facebook kind of taking a cut on that. Yeah. When I buy uh, music, I try to buy it directly from the artist if possible. Yeah. And I think the internet would be a much better place if we had basically micropayments uh, embedded in web browsers. Mm-hmm. So like it could honestly take like 0.8 cents when you like read a news site. Yeah. Which, that's fine. But you know what? Those That would add up to actual journalism instead of commercial corporate interest like driven journalism. There's... There's a way to do this, and it just it never got done in the late 90s, early 2000s when we had a chance, and that's sad. Well, we were still riding high off the uh, coke-fueled wave of uh, the stupid, incorrect economics of the 80s. Yes. Like, much. we have such a fucked idea of how an economy works and how powerful the American economy is mm-hmm. because of the decimation after World War II and our yeah. reliance on making shit that kills people. Most of the podcasts that I actually really like when I see, that I just download a new one I get excited about, are by professionals. These are people that have worked in uh, news media or comedy, or you know they, they've already kind of been trained to do this. So I think what we're doing is amateurish at best, and that's okay. But I want to acknowledge it. Yeah, like, I mean, I like we're... to do things correctly, but I hate professionalism, and I don't know how to reconcile that. It's fine. There, it needs to be organized well, and there needs to be a sheen of polish to it. Sure, um, it, it doesn't have to be explicitly professional. I mean, a lot of our favorite albums weren't. Right. Those well, are the best rawest ones. Mm-hmm. There's a great YouTube. Uh... What I'm saying is, I'm Mike Ness. Cool. I don't... Okay. You're going to throw out references now? Because I can throw out some references I, that you don't know. I no, who's Mike Ness? Tell me. He's the guy from Social Distortion. Oh, of course. That's why I don't know him. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I like their one song. It's cute. Which one? <laughs> their one song. Uh, dude, I know like five it's of their songs. It's all <laughs> the same song. Is it... Oh, oh, right. That criticism of punk. <laughs> nope. That's a criticism of Social Distortion. <laughs> I'll broaden it so that uh, so that I don't need <laughs> I mean, to deal with any unpleasant it, truths. <laughs> uh, yeah, we both have ideas about punk rock and whatnot. We can talk about that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that would be great. We can just like 
reference bands at each other for 45 minutes. That'll be an episode. Uh huh. Yeah. It would be easier if we could actually play the copyrighted songs on the episode to illustrate our points. Uh, well, we can tell our listeners to pause and uh, go to YouTube and yeah. type in uh, this song. Yeah, no, I think I, so. In the description of the podcast, I'm going to probably load up like a, just a ton of YouTube and SoundCloud or uh, yeah, links like that. I'll probably put together some uh, playlists on wait not pandora spotify, spotify yeah um, i don't like that you have to install something to have spotify i don't do that oh how do you get around that i haven't signed up yet ah uh, <laughs> yeah install something what on your laptop uh oh, yeah like no. it, it's an app it, it's not a website no, no. that you can fucking use no no i will find a way around that great i signed up for twitter it took me two days of like just <laughs> brute forcing you're not going to get this goddamn information from a you piece of shit um i will find a way to have playlists that people can share um without compromising you can actually find my <laughs> my live journal very easily that where i actually tell you the entirety of my past <laughs> it's it's a very long live journal and i'm i haven't read it in a long time but I did. Uh, it see really some of it. feels like I should be reading it and asking you pointed questions every oh, episode man. about what I've discovered in your live journal. Like, <laughs> write that down. That's that's a segment. Um, luckily, um, my uh, my blog was primarily on MySpace. Mm, yeah, um, and it just got erased. That's, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, like, oh, so blissful. Except there was a very short period. Um, when I had just moved to San Francisco that I had begun to pretend that I had just bought a large snake mm -hmm. and was just making entries in my blog about, about this gigantic snake, gigantic and snake that I got. because the snake ate you? Um, no, no. Oh. I was I just okay. kept going until like friends in real life started calling and texting and being like, you have a fucking anaconda? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, oh, people do read this shit. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, uh, I wrote my book Basically, my autobiography in Texas, and then I got to the point where the history caught up with my real life, uh -huh. and then I was going to be telling stories about friends that were reading the journal, uh -huh. and I was like, ooh, ah, uh, I'm not sure if I can represent this as objective uh -huh. fact when <laughs> uh, there's other people that have other points of view, and maybe I shouldn't just represent that as truth. And so I kind of stopped around, I think, 2002, 2003. But that it is it, the conundrum. It goes through a, a ton of my like early life and whatnot. And I know I have a lot of fans that really want to know. You really do. Um, I'm I'm amazed with uh, how the Accuracy Third listeners like really love the guests that we have on. Um, I've, You're not amazed. Come on. I great. really am. No, um, they're great. I they're, you know, they deserve sure. it. It's but like it's not the way that I listen to podcasts. Sure. Um, like I don't remember a lot of the basic information about guests. Yeah. Um, I'm a fan of the hosts. Um, gotcha. Like yeah. I don't know any specific person that was interviewed on uh, on like This American Life or uh, Reply All or any of that shit. Like I remember the story about those people, but like. I wouldn't remember the person's name and then be excited if I met that person. I found a guy named Scott Carrier from This American Life. He's absolutely amazing. Should check him out. It's not homework yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he has some really just amazing radio work. Scott oh, Carrier. that guy. Yeah. Yeah, that okay, guy's so amazing. Okay, so you know what? You do listen to <laughs> The other people outside of that. Um, well, I learned about him in college because I was a communications student. Oh, that's, um, okay. So I I learned about him and his transformative radio work. Oh, it's um, amazing. It, it's like uh, it, it's unlike anything else. There's yeah. like two other people that are at the level of him mm -hmm. in terms of uh, crafting the like original audio radio medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're um, not going to do that. No, um, we won't be transformative at all. Um, but. I was thinking about that when you were talking earlier about when you're on the internet, you have to think of yourself as broadcasting. Yeah. And 
it was in college that for the first time, and like I had done radio in college, um, but I hadn't taken this class at that point, and I wasn't thinking about like like how broadcasting actually works, what the word really means, and that there is also narrow casting. Yeah. And there is a version of communication which is much more pointed, and it's not just I'm shitting this out in every direction at these amps, hoping that somebody on this frequency can hear it. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that I like podcasting in that there's a self-selection with mm-hmm. the audience. And also just learning uh, – the nuts and bolts of it as i did in the last couple days that um you know you host your own mp3 files Mm -hmm. and you have an rss feed that rss feed does not need to be listed on any of the aggregators if i have a website that has an rss feed but that i don't publicize Uh only give links to that to individual people i might be able to skirt say the uh, over controlling uh, filters that look for copyrighted material, say mm-hmm. for songs. And I could potentially have a podcast that you could actually subscribe to outside of iTunes mm-hmm. that I wouldn't get in trouble for. Yeah. As long as I would publish it and then maybe delete it a couple days later. Mm-hmm. And especially if it's uh, using HTTPS, uh, that could actually be a thing where I can make playlists and talk about music to my fans who have heard me DJ and want to hear me talk about music. Uh, that's a like really good that. thing for like the Patreon feed. Um, Patreon yeah. does a mm-hmm. great job of allowing you to just like post your media up there now. I was playing with that today. Um, and then we wouldn't have to delete it because it's a closed ecosystem. Correct. And I, I'd be enthusiastic about that. Or even like if you Patreon, say like, you know, a dollar or three dollars or whatever, I could send a link to directly to an email. And uh, it would have to be at some level a, a way that I could verify that that's a person. Uh, there's messaging inside yeah. of Patreon. Like they've they've well, done a not, much better job like of shitty cleaning person. up their Let's service. put it that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, if there's anyone from the FBI who, like, is going to get us for transmitting stolen media across right. state lines, then well, it's, that's it's what about, they're going to do. That's all about bots. That's about fingerprinting, and mm-hmm. uh, and it's it's algorithmic. There's no person that just sits there and listens to all podcasts and sees if there's copyrighted right. stuff. Um, it's, it's machines. And if you can just skirt the machines, then... Eh. Great. Let's try to skirt the machines. Um, okay. So legal disclaimer. Uh, we just got a call. Uh, we are not going to do that at all. At all. Never. Yeah. Uh-huh. It turns nope. out that we have a lawyer and our lawyer is pretty displeased yeah, with just, what we just said. They're just, just waiting said. really hard right now and saying, no, don't do that. So we're not going to do that at all. Yeah. Um, um, so if you guys go to our Patreon, which we haven't set up yet, but uh, hopefully at some point we will. And you do give us a dollar, we will not be giving out any copyrighted material through any RSS or any other feeds. Mm-mm. Is that good? That's good. Yeah, he's, he's he he vanished back into a weird cloud of gnats. I want to say so. I have my podcast kind of universe that I listen to. I'm oh, curious yeah, yeah. because I know that you and I overlap a lot, uh-huh. dude. Today, the new hardcore history came out. I've been Hardcore fucking, history is not my thing. I, I know. I've it. been waiting for this mm-hmm. episode for like almost a year now. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been doing Supernova in the East right. about yeah, yeah, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And like we're finally to the last part where like the terrible decisions are going to be made. And oh, okay, homework. If anyone listening to this has not read Hiroshima, um, steal your goddamn gut and read Hiroshima. Read it. Is it a book or is it yeah, a website? It's a book. It's. Uh, I think that's a little difficult for. I'm gonna say it's like a, a 180 pages. It's a quick, terrible read. Um, it's like as long as Johnny got his gun, um, but it's just it's the oral history of the people that survived Hiroshima. I want to say as far as so, are do you just subscribe to everything that the cracked? producers uh no that diaspora Um, 
So uh, I am still subscribed to uh, the Cracked Podcast. Okay, the Cracked Podcast is great. Adam uh, Schmidt, Schmitty the Clam, Schmitty the Champ is great. I love that guy. He's However, fine. hold on. <laughs> He is the last holdout. No, 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 no. Look, he is. He's, he's a fucking hostage. He's the last cool person there. They just demolished that creative team with it's no, with no forewarning, just garbage. And Schmitty the Clam, I love him, and it's a good podcast. It's a However, good podcast. I I need them to stop doing like the thirteen whatever things that have whatevered. That's it's a gimmick. They're they're playing they're riffing on a thing that BuzzFeed and Gawker. Yeah, did. I just I, I need you to do like fucking three things in an hour, guys. Dude, okay, so they. Mm, uh, this, uh, that's this, just this me. I'm not topic, saying they're wrong. Dude, I'm they saying they're Sean bad. Baby. Dot com. They have Sean Baby as <laughs> they a writer. Do. Mm-hmm. That guy used to be golden. Yeah. Just fucking amazing. When did you ever check out SeanBaby.com? dot mm-hmm. Back in the like. Okay, sorry. Fat girls with party hats. No. Like, oh, dude, old school, just fucking ridiculous he's still insightful and he's a strong writer mm-hmm. but it's garbage it's it's, it's mostly fluff. fucking schlock and garbage um and we can maybe we can go into why that whole thing happened because that history is is a huge inciting incident for uh for why i want to do this right. sort of thing but um okay so small beans mm-hmm. is michael swaim he's from cracked he and Abe Epperson uh, started a new company that only takes Patreon, and one of their podcasts is called the Coen Brothers Brothers, where they actually like break down each Coen Brothers movie in sequence, um, based on like cinematography, writing, just breaking it down by people that actually know it and love it, and this uh, play on a cracked podcast from before called the Kurt Vonnegut guys. Where they actually like read each Kurt Vonnegut book and then just went through it. So it's it's a great analysis. It's funny as hell. Um, I love them. I also like Ninety Nine Percent Invisible, which I mm-hmm. think I don't know. Does everyone know about that? Or is uh, that... I think so. I okay. found out uh, once I started the podcast that uh, I lived like half a block from um, KALW. Yeah. Oh no. Which is where they're right from. Downtown. I found out that one of my friends who I met by working as a manager with at Burning Man, she was his intern at KALW nice. when he came up with 99PI. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they're really good, and the Memory Palace is really good, and mm-hmm. I almost never listen to either of them. I listen um, to 99PI pretty much every time. I did for Sometimes like the I'll first 150 like, or so episodes. I don't have the time for exactly what this is, and I don't mm-hmm. know what it is, and it's going to be something weird, and I... I I, I need wanna, to focus a little bit too much on, yeah. on both of them. That's the thing. And, like, I need my podcasts for playing, like, when I'm building shit or cooking. Like, I have different I have different modes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the other one, this is not a suggestion at all. This is an illustration. Um, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is a computer game called NetHack that no one has heard of. It's uh, very detailed and has no graphics literally no graphics whatsoever and i wanted to do a themed topic on this podcast about mm-hmm. nethack to tell people how goddamn amazing this thing is great but i wanted to check out and see if there's another podcast that already talked about nethack because uh-huh. i didn't want to you know reinvent the wheel right and i found a podcast called roguelike nice which holy shit if you want to talk about niche marketing these guys talk for hours about really detailed like code examples of these weird games that no one plays. Mm-hmm. And there's like a hundred episodes. So it's not a suggestion that you listen to it, but a suggestion that wow, niche narrow casting yeah. is amazing. I fell asleep to listening to this thing. Um it's amazing. And I do want to do an episode of this podcast about my passion for NetHack mm-hmm. because uh, yeah, I don't know anything no, about it, but I do no like one games. Does. It's fantastic. It's uh, it's one of the best games in the world, and it's been going on for like twenty years. Tell us, donate the podcast ten dollars to. to something or some things. Yeah, so the, uh, I give uh, five bucks a month to the Beth. Uh, five bucks a month to the Bechtel cast. 
Uh-huh. Um, oh, I, yeah, I love them. Yeah, they're great. Mm-hmm. Um, they either tell me things that I didn't think about movies that I'm probably not going to watch again, mm-hmm. or they explain what happens in rom-coms that I'm never going to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's great. I also have a subscription to uh, Current Affairs magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, I've started buying magazines as of this year. Yeah. Um, I, Current I'll Affairs give, I'll give and money to things Trust. online. I won't um, necessarily get the, the physical magazine. but Yeah. Um, and like if you do get the physical Current Affairs magazine, it opens up uh, their archive mm-hmm. for PDFs of all of their previous issues. But like Current Affairs is... I think of it as like kind of aspirational the new yorker Hmm. like current affairs is the magazine that that new yorker wishes it was Mm -hmm. um it truly is funny um Mm. it's tongue-in-cheek stuff and cartoons actually have a perspective about something other than like pretty wealthy elite people who live on the Northeast and like have master's degrees or doctorates. Yeah. Um, and high fructose is, uh, made by an artist and, uh, my friend Attaboy. I who, love high fructose. I uh, loved it. I just I fucking really started it getting it. Like, um, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you the old issues. I bought a two year subscription. Um, yeah, it's hard to be a publisher. Um, yeah. And like, Dude, it's important to have fucking art well, magazines. A, a lot of people will be like, oh, but if I only give $2, it's not that big a deal, so I'm going to wait until I can get, like, 40 No, No, just give the $2. Give $40 when you can afford $40. Sure. Um, give a dollar or two now. Mm-hmm. It means so goddamn much. Yeah. Um, And I talk to everyone um, for everyone. Accuracy Third. Who, Every single who person. Gives me, oh, okay. um, who gives us money through Patreon or who just reaches out. Um, I... Dude, I, I'm a person who likes people and the things they do. Oh, I hate um, people uh, and I hate the things it's they do. But easier I want to, to like people who do things. Yeah, <laughs> I've discovered. At least you've got that in common. Well, that's my initial response, and then once the person actually talks to me, I'm like, "Oh, you're not so bad." Okay. Yeah, ah, I guess you're fine. <laughs> it, it's it's a high bar to get over um, to speak to new people because. Mm. I don't always come off that well. Um, people who don't <laughs> know me, both, me brother. don't understand that, like, I'm doing a bit. I'm always doing a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I had this. Oh, but I've had friends that, like, started with, like, he's they not knowing that I'm doing a bit, but mm-hmm. then liking the bit that I was doing. And, and like, then not oh, wait, liking no, the me buddy. behind the bit. Wait, wait, no, that's not me. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, <laughs> you, you need to backtrack a little bit. So I I had this interview like three or four weeks ago, and uh, like uh, I'm in a pretty fraught place in my career. Like I had a bunch of jobs for a bunch of time, and then I had a job for one year, and now I have a job for like nine months, and I'm trying to find a new job. And that's something you have to explain away. Um, so I'm interviewing, and uh, the lady interviewing me asks me, like, how will she know if I'm unhappy at this place? And I start looking for another job. And obviously she won't, because you hold the fucking money, yeah. and it is not safe for me as a person who needs to depend on money to live to yeah, tell you that. That's a weird question to ask. Yeah, but, you know, I, I tell them that, like, well, you know, like, I've been really upfront in this interview. I find it very difficult to uh, be surreptitious and underhanded. Um, I mean, I... <laughs> I tell it how it is. I, I'm Frank. Mm. And she goes, oh, I like that. I'm Frank, too. And the other guy I'm interviewing with goes, yeah, I'd describe myself as Frank. Wow. Which is Three when, Franks. like, I, I need to slam the intellectual brakes yeah. on and be like, nobody knows uh-huh. we're doing a bit but me. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Like, you don't say that we're all Frank. You don't fucking mention Frank. Nobody is Frank. I do Accuracy Third with my friends Bethst and Rex, and I do something else. With Zeno. And I'm Zeno, and I do something else with G Day. Sometimes I'll talk on Accuracy Third.